Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to talk about the one-way repeated measures analysis of variance. We've already talked about the logic of the repeated measures ANOVA, and we've also looked at all of the formulas. And, of course, we've already looked at one complete example. Let's look at another. All right, let's see what we're dealing with here. The data below represents free throws made out of 10 before practice, that would be pretest, immediately after practice, that would be retest, one day later and one week later. Does practice influence performance? If so, do the effects persist? Test with an alpha of 0.05. Well, you can see that we measured six people here, and we measured those same six people on one, two, three, four different occasions. So if we're measuring the same people more than twice, we need to do a repeated measures ANOVA. And in general, we're trying to answer the question, are there differences in their free throw performance over time? As you know, the first thing that I like to do is some basic prep work. I like to have everything computed that's necessary so that we can use the formulas that we need throughout the rest of the four steps. You might recall that in our first example, we went through all of the prep work together. What I recommend that you do for this example is pause the video and work it all out on your own, just to make sure you know how to do it. And then you can come back to the video and check your work against mine. Just to make sure that everybody understands all the important pieces of the prep work, I'm going to go through a couple important reminders. Remember, t values are just totals, so all we need to do is add up these values to find this total. From that point, it's really easy to compute a mean. So we're simply going to take that total, this is 21, divide by those six people, and we find that the mean free throws made during that pretest period is 3.5. We also need to compute sum of squares. Make sure you don't forget how to do that. Students often stress when they have to compute sum of squares, but really it's the most basic thing we learned in our class. We learned it so early on, and we've never put it away. All of the different statistical procedures that we've learned include some form of sum of squares. So just make sure you master it. We need to know small n. That's the number of people that we measured. We measured six people. We need to know the large n, the capital N. That's the total number of measurements that we have overall. You'll see that we measured six different people, and we measured those people four different times. So we have 24 measurements overall. That's what our large n equals in this particular case. We also need to know k. K represents the number of treatment conditions, or the number of times we took measurements. We took measurements at pretest, retest, one day later, and one week later. So we had four different measurements, four different treatment conditions. We also need to know G, which is the grand total. The easiest way to find it is simply to add up all the totals from each treatment condition. So if we add up 21, 33, 39, and 36, we'll get a grand total of 129. And then we also need to know the sum of x squared. So if we take every single measurement and we square it, so here we would have 4, 16, 9, 36, 1. If we go through every single one of those values and square it and then add them up, we'll get 797. And then the final thing that we need that is specific to the repeated measures ANOVA are these person totals. So remember, we've measured each person several times. Now we can get a sense of how much those people on average differ. And the way that we can get that information is by combining all of their individual measurements into a total measurement. That's what the p-value is in this situation. It's a person total. So for this first person, we can just add up the number of free throws that she made over those four different measurements. 2 and 4 is 6, plus another 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15. So that person's total is 15. That should be all of the prep work that we need. Let's go ahead and move on to step one. At step one, we state our hypotheses. Now I can see as I look at this right here, I copied and pasted from our first example, but I failed to update the subscripts. So just pay careful attention as I talk about it. Remember, the null hypothesis always states there's no effect. In this case, the most appropriate way to think about that is that there are no differences in free throws from pretest to retest to one day later to one week later. So, in other words, mu for pretest 
equals the mu for retest, which equals the mu for one day later, which equals the mu for one week later. And the mu's in this case represent the average number of free throws made. In other words, the null hypothesis states that all of the population means are equal. There are no differences from time one to time two to time three to time four. The alternative hypothesis states that there are differences. And the easiest way for us to state that in this particular case is that at least one population mean differs from another. All right, as you know, we always proceed as if the null hypothesis is true. Well, step two tells us how much evidence we're going to need to reject that null hypothesis. And in order to find that critical value, we first need to compute degrees of freedom. So let's switch views and work on that together. Now, I know we're still getting comfortable with the repeated measures analysis of variance, but remember, we have quite a bit of experience already with ANOVA because we already spent an entire chapter learning about the independent measures one-way ANOVA. So let's focus on the things we're really comfortable with. When it comes to degrees of freedom, we're very comfortable with computing degrees of freedom between groups, degrees of freedom within groups, and degrees of freedom total. So let's work on those first. Let's start at the top with degrees of freedom between treatments. We need to ask ourselves how many measurements were taken. There was a measurement taken at pretest, at retest, one day later, and one week later. So there were four different treatments in this study. That would be K. 4 minus 1 equals 3. Now let's work on degrees of freedom within treatments. N, large N, represents the number of measurements we have overall. There are six people, and we took four measurements for each person. 6 times 4 is 24. So that large N was 24. And we want to subtract the number of treatments that we have in that particular experiment. And in this case, that equals 4. 24 minus 4 equals 20. Let's move on to degrees of freedom total. We take the total number of measurements, that's n, we know that's 24, and we just subtract 1. 24 minus 1 equals 23. Let's check to see if that makes sense. Degrees of freedom between plus degrees of freedom within should equal degrees of freedom total. 3 plus 20 does equal 23. So we're on the right track. Now let's compute degrees of freedom between subjects and degrees of freedom error. Those two computations are unique to the repeated measures analysis of variance. And keep this in mind as well. Degrees of freedom between subjects and degrees of freedom error are subcomponents of degrees of freedom within treatments. In other words, when we combine those two values for degrees of freedom between subjects and degrees of freedom error, that should equal 20, the value that we got for degrees of freedom within treatments. So let's just keep that in mind as we compute them. Let's compute degrees of freedom between subjects. We need to take small n minus 1. Small n represents the number of people who we measured. We measured 6 people. 6 minus 1 equals 5. Now let's compute degrees of freedom error. Using this formula right here, we can take the number of treatment groups that we have. There are four treatment groups, four treatment conditions. 4 minus 1 would be 3. And we know there were six people, so small n equals six. Six minus one would be five. So we're left with three times five, three times five equals 15. Let's see if that makes sense. Five plus 15 does equal 20. So everything's working out fine at this point. Everything makes sense. Remember, when we do an analysis of variance, there are two different degrees of freedom that we need to use to find our critical value. One is from degrees of freedom between groups, and the other from degrees of freedom error. So we have 3 and 15 degrees of freedom. We're using an alpha of 0.05 in this example, so let's consult our F distribution and find our critical value. Here's our table of critical values for the F distribution when we're using an alpha of 0.05. We need to look up the degrees of freedom in the numerator. That would be degrees of freedom between treatments we know that we had three degrees of freedom between treatments. We had 15 degrees of freedom error. That would be degrees of freedom for the denominator. So let's come on down here, we see 15 degrees of freedom. Now I wanna see where this row and that column converge. So I'm gonna move on over to this column right here, and right here would be our critical value, 3.29. So just to be clear, degrees of freedom equals three, and 15 
and we found that our critical value based on an alpha of 0.05 was 3.29. 3.29 is somewhere right around here. So that's where we will mark off our critical region. And I'll say F 0.05 equals 3.29. So that, my friends, is the amount of evidence that we will need to reject the null hypothesis. All right, now I think we're ready to move on to step three and find out how much evidence we actually have. Here we are at step three. Because we have quite a bit of experience computing sum of squares between treatments, sum of squares within treatments, and sum of squares total, let's work on those calculations first. We'll start at the top by computing sum of squares between treatments. According to the formula, we need to take each column total, square it, divide by the small n, and then after we do that for each of the column totals, we will subtract the grand total squared divided by our large n. So let's look at that first column. We can see that that first column has a total of 21. We're going to need to square that and divide by 6. The second column has a total of 33. We're going to have to square that and divide by 6. That third column has a total of 39. We'll need to square that and divide by 6. And then finally, that fourth column has a total of 36. We need to square that and divide by 6. Do you see how we've exhausted this part of the formula? So now we're going to move on. We need to subtract this fraction right here. So I move over here. I take that grand total, which is 129. We need to square that and divide by the big N, which in this case is 24. So let's go ahead and work through each one of those fractions. That first fraction asks us to take 21 and square it and then divide by 6. That equals 73.5. Let's move on to the second fraction. 33 squared divided by 6 equals 181.5. Third fraction, 39 squared divided by 6 equals 253.5. And now let's look at that fourth fraction. We need 36 squared divided by 6 equals 216. Now we need to subtract that last fraction. We'll take 129, square it, and then divide that by 24. That equals 693.38. And finally, we'll do the addition and subtraction necessary to get our final answer. So let's take 73.5, add to that 181.5, add to that 253.5, Add to that 216, and then subtract 693.38. That equals 31.12. So that's our final answer for sum of squares between treatments. And remember, that's a basic measurement of the variability between each one of those measurements we took, from pretest to retest to one day later to one week later. Let's move on to computing sum of squares within treatments. All that we need to do is add up the sum of squares for each one of these treatment groups. So here we've got a value of sum of squares, here, here, and here. All that we need to do is add those up. When we add up those values, we get 72.5. Let's go ahead and compute sum of squares total. For this formula, we need to know the sum of x squared. We have that right here. And then we also need to compute this fraction right here. Let's work on that first. So we need g squared. g equals 129. So I'm going to take 129 and square it. According to the formula, we need to divide that by our big N, our capital N, and that's 24. So I'm going to divide by 24. So that fraction equals 693.38. With that in mind, we can compute our final answer. The sum of x squared was 797. And now we want to subtract the value of that fraction that we just computed, 693.38. That equals 103.62. Let's see if that value makes sense. Sum of squares between treatments plus sum of squares within treatments should equal sum of squares total. So let's add those up. Sum of squares between treatments was equal to 31.12. Let's add that to sum of squares within treatments, which was equal to 72.5. And that equals 103.62. So we're on the right track. All right, now we're ready to focus our attention on sum of squares between subjects and sum of squares error. And those two things are unique to a repeated measures analysis of variance.
Keep this in mind too. These two things combined should total our sum of squares within treatment's value. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and compute sum of squares between subjects. Sum of squares between subjects is essentially computing the variability across the different people in our study. In other words, it's measuring the individual differences in the free throws that these people made. According to the formula, we need to sum up a series of fractions. In the numerator, we're going to take each person's total value, we're going to square it, and then we're going to divide by k, which is the number of treatment groups that we have. After we do that for each person, then we move on to this part of the formula where we subtract this fraction. So let's look at this part of the formula first. That first person has a person total of 15. So we have to take 15 and square it, and then divide by the number of groups, which is 4. That equals 56.25. Let's move on to the next person. That person's total is 23. So we'll take 23 and square it and divide by 4. That equals 132.25. Let's move on to the third person. That person's total is 25. We're going to square that and divide by 4. That equals 156.25. Next person. That person's total is 30. We're going to square it and divide by 4. That equals 225. Next person. The next person has a total of 15. Let's square that and divide by 4. That equals 56.25. And finally, let's move on to that last person. That person had a total of 21. We're going to square it and divide by 4. That equals 110.25. Now we've exhausted this part of the equation. So we need to move on by subtracting this fraction. So right here we're going to subtract that grand total squared. So I'm going to key in 129 and square it divided by the overall n, the total number of measurements, which is 24. So that equals 693.38. To get our final answer, let's just do the necessary addition and subtraction. So we'll start with 56.25, and then we'll add 132.25, then we'll add 156.25, 225, 56.25, and add 110.25, and then subtract 693.38 equals 42.87. 42.87, looks like we're on the right track. Now remember, sum of squares between subjects and sum of squares error are both subcomponents of sum of squares within treatments. So in order to find sum of squares error, all that we need to do is take sum of squares within treatments and subtract sum of squares between subjects. So let's do that. We'll clear out the calculator. We'll take 72.5 and then subtract 42.87. That equals 29.63. At this point, it's wise to visit our source table and fill in some of these cells. We already computed all of the degrees of freedom, and we already computed all of the sums of squares. You can see there's not much left for us to do. We need to compute mean square between treatments and mean square error. Once we get those two values, we can construct our F ratio. Let's begin by computing mean square between treatments. Sum of squares between treatments equals 31.12. We need to divide that by degrees of freedom between treatments, which equals 3. So that equals 10.37. Now let's compute mean square error. So we're going to take sum of squares error, which is 29.63, and then divide that by degrees of freedom error, which is 15. That equals 1.98. And then finally, with those two values, we can construct our F ratio. So in the numerator, we need mean square between treatments. That equals 10.37. Remember, that value represents the variability between our treatment groups. We want to divide that by mean square error, which equals 1.98. Mean square error represents variability that we can't explain. That's error variance. That gives us an F value equal to 5.24. That is our obtained F value. We now need to compare that to our critical F value. If our obtained value exceeds that critical value, in other words, if we are inside that critical region, then we can reject the null hypothesis and state 
that we have statistically significant results. That somewhere between time one, time two, time three, and time four, there is some type of difference in the free throws that those participants made. Let's take a look. We found an F value of 5.24, and 5.24 is somewhere right around there. So let's label it F equals 5.24. You can see we are clearly inside that critical region. We are inside the rejection zone, and that's what we need to know. So in other words, when I ask, are we inside the rejection zone? Are we inside the critical region? The answer is yes. And that means the follow-up questions will be answered yes as well. Our first follow-up question is, should we reject the null hypothesis? And the answer is yes, we should. Remember, the null hypothesis stated that the population mean number of free throws at each different point in time was equal. We're rejecting that. Instead, we're going to embrace the alternative hypothesis, which states at least some type of difference exists from pretest to retest to one day later to one week later. Next follow-up question. Do we have statistically significant results? And the answer is yes, we do. Our results are statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Next follow-up question. Is it possible that we're making a type 1 error? And the answer is yes, it is at least possible. What's the probability that we're making a type 1 error? Well, we're using an alpha of 0.05. So over the long run, using this type of strategy, we would expect to make type 1 errors about 5% of the time. And while we're at it, let's take care of this as well. At some point, we're going to need to write up our results. And we're going to have to contend with this situation. We'll have to determine, is the probability of finding our results just by chance less than 5%? Or is the probability of finding our results just by chance greater than 5%? Keep in mind, we found that our F ratio was inside this small critical region. If it's inside that small critical region, the probability of finding that value just by chance should be small. So between those two options, what's small? P less than 0.05 or P greater than 0.05? What is small would be P less than 0.05. All right, now we're ready to write up our results. Here we are at step four, and we need to do four different things. We need to discuss if we're going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We need to put our results in everyday language. We need to show how we would write this up for a journal article, and we also need to compute the most appropriate measurement of effect size. Here's a good example of how we could write this up. Our F ratio was clearly inside the critical region. This is unlikely if the null hypothesis is true, so we reject the null hypothesis. In other words, our data is inconsistent with the null hypothesis, and that's why we rejected it. In everyday language, what does that mean? Significant differences in free throws exist among the testing times. Let's take a look at these means. From pretest to retest, we can see there was an increase in the number of free throws that were made. And then from retest to one day later, there was another increase in the average number of free throws made. And then from one day later to one week later, there was a small decline in the average number of free throws made. This analysis of variance tells us that there's at least one difference in there among those group means. If we wanted to find out exactly where differences occur, we would need to follow up with post-tests. The next thing we need to do is show how this result would be summarized in a journal article. Well, we did an analysis of variance, and when we do an ANOVA, we compute an F ratio. We computed an F ratio with 3 and 15 degrees of freedom, and the value that we computed was 5.24. And that result was statistically significant as evidenced by us putting P less than 0.05. The final thing we need to do is compute a measurement of effect size, and we're using eta squared. Eta squared measures the proportion of variability accounted for in those free throws across those four testing times. Because we're measuring a proportion of the variability, in the numerator, we're going to have a measurement of variability, in this case sum of squares, representing the variability in free throws across those four different timings. And then, when we have a repeated measures design, instead of dividing by total variability, in this case sum of squares total, we're going to subtract from that the variability due to the individual differences of our research subjects. So that leaves us with this fraction right here. We have sum of squares between treatments, 
31.12, divided by sum of squares total, which is right here, 103.62, minus sum of squares between subjects, 42.87. That leaves us with 31.12 divided by 60.75. 31.12 divided by 60.75. That equals 0.51. That tells us that 51% of the variability in their free throw performance can be explained by the time that they were tested. And keep this in mind, something happened between pretest and retest in terms of those times of testing, and that's that they got practice. So this is really a test of that practice to see if that practice had some type of an effect on their performance. All right, my friends, I know that was a lot of work. It really does take a lot to do an analysis of variance. But at this point, we have quite a bit of practice. We went through a few examples with the independent measures, one-way analysis of variance. And now we've gone through a couple examples with the repeated measures, one-way analysis of variance. So I'm hoping by now it's starting to feel relatively comfortable. Well, that's it for now. I'll see you in the next video. In the meantime, be safe.